Well, good morning and welcome to our Friday morning daily devotional. Hopefully you're safe, you're sound, you're, you and your loved ones are healthy. Hopefully you're enjoying these devotionals as we take in time each day to kind of think for just a few moments about what Bible has said about something relevant to our faith, relevant to our particular life circumstances. This morning we're going back to the book of Psalms as we kind of work through some of my favorite Psalms, but I want to work through them as the authors and the editors have compiled them. And so on Wednesday we looked at Psalm number one. This morning we're looking at Psalm number two. Now if you remember, Psalm number one outlined for us two ways to live. Either you live the way of the righteous, the one who is dedicated and meditates on the law of the Lord and does it. That one's blessed. He flourishes. He prospers in all that he does. Or there's the one who is in the way of the foolish, the one who ignores God's word, the one who is on the path to sure destruction. As we thought about that psalm, hopefully you picked up on it on Wednesday, that really, apart from Adam in his original state, no man has been able to keep that commandment perfectly. All of us are actually on the journey of the other man. We're all the foolish one. We're all the ones who are in trouble come the day of judgment when we won't be able to stand with the righteous. We need help. Psalm number two offers us help. So look at Psalm number two. Let's read it and let's kind of break it down a little bit this morning for you. There the psalmist begins. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And so this morning with Psalm number two, we have an interesting psalm. It, it is the answer, arguably, to what is left undone, if you will, in Psalm number one. But the psalm here, number two, actually comes across as two different types of psalms. Many of you didn't realize this, but there are at least seven different types or categories of psalms in the book of Psalms. One of those types is what is known as a royal psalm. As the name implies, royal psalms focused on the king. They're typically praises to the king or they're praises for the king. Sometimes they're prayers specifically that God would bless and watch over the king and take care of him. This morning's psalm happens to be a royal psalm. It talks about God's king set on the throne in Jerusalem. But it's also another type of psalm. It also falls into the category of messianic psalms, psalms that are about the Messiah. We know the New Testament writers read it this way because Psalm number two is referenced explicitly in the book of Hebrews as that author makes the case that Jesus is better than, and then he lists a whole litany of things that in the Old Testament were important. They had their role, but their role has since passed with the coming of the Messiah. And so as we read Psalm number two, our hope, our answer to the problem presented in Psalm one is God's designated king, both the king of Israel for a season but ultimately, the king we need, the only king that fits the description here in Psalm number two, is the Messiah. So let's go through it quickly, and let's consider what the psalm says. And so the psalmist begins, why the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Why are humans in rebellion against God? Think about it. Why are people in outright rebellion in some sense today against the government's recommendations a couple weeks ago, and now more and more so the government's orders about sheltering in place, about social distancing, about all these things meant to protect us. Why do the king set themselves against the king of the Lord is anointed in verse 2? Why are they claiming, let us burst their bonds apart, let's cast away their cord, let's rebel and throw off their shackles? Human sinfulness is about lawlessness. In fact, that's what John says in the first book of John. He says, sin is lawlessness. Sin is acting as though there is no king over you. When there's a king over us, we're always chafing at the bit. We're always trying to find a way to exert our own authority and our own freedom. 
That's what we do against authorities over us, the government, whether it's a speed limit sign or whether it's the president of the United States or if it's your commander in the military, whatever. We always have this deep down innate desire because of the sinfulness of our hearts to sin and rebel against. Well, verse 4 tells us, God, he who sits in the heavens, laughs. He holds them in derision. He's not impressed by the rebelliousness of man's sinful desires. In fact, he's got an answer for it. He's got an answer for our rebellion. He's got an answer for our lawlessness. He's got an answer for the fact that we don't meditate on the law and we don't keep it per chapter 1. Notice what he says. He'll speak to them in his wrath, verse 5, and he'll terrify them in his fury. Right? The psalmist talks about it here. The writer of Hebrews, again, talks about the fact that we serve a God who's a consuming fire. He's going to terrify them in his fury. He's going to speak to Job out of the whirlwind. And then he says this in verse 6. As for me, here's God's answer to man's rebellion, his sinfulness. I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. The king, of course, could be the king of Jerusalem. He is anointed, per verse 2. You anoint, you put a royal on their head to designate who God is called to be the king. This king, in your Bible translation, is probably capitalized in verse 6 to give you an indication it's more than just a royal psalm. But he's on Zion. That is literally Jerusalem, God's holy hill. Remember, there on the holy hill in Jerusalem is where the temple is built. That's where the sacrifices are made. That's where people's relationships with God are restored. But it's the king who's going to do it here, not a priest. God is determined. He's made a decree. He says, I will tell of my decree. What's the decree? Now notice the switch in the language if you're looking at verse 7. The Lord said to me. And so it's actually not the psalmist now who's speaking, but the anointed one, the one who sat on the hill. The Lord said to me, you are my son, son of God, son of of the one who sits on high. You are my son, and here's language you're all familiar with from the book of John chapter 3, verse 16. Today I have begotten you. It's not the language of procreation. It's not the language of being born. The language of begotten comes from the Old Testament, and it has to do with who's your daddy. It has to do with whose inheritance do you receive. That's why all those begots in the Old Testament, so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. The sin of one father is passed on to the son. Likewise, the promise, the covenant to one father is passed down from generation to generation, from Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob. But for God's son, the one that God has begotten, he is the only one like God. What is God's belongs to the son. No king in Jerusalem before or ever since has been able to claim that level of privilege and inheritance directly from God, except for one, you are my son that I have begotten you. If you ask of me, he says in verse 8, I'll make the nations your heritage. I'll give you the world. Remember, Satan tried to tempt Jesus by offering him. If you just bow down and worship me here, I'll give you the nations. That's what he's referencing is this psalm. God has already promised that whatever the Messiah asks, God will give him, including the nations. The ends of the earth will be your possession. You break them with a rod of iron, you'll dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, here's a very unfamiliar image of the Messiah. Not just the lion and the lamb, the loving and doving, you know, the Jesus is my boyfriend kind of view of Jesus we often have. But here's a picture of the Messiah as a warrior, a king who's come to bring God's wrath against those who rebelled against him, to bring peace through, to borrow a language from my days in the military, through superior firepower. You'll break them with a rod of iron. You'll dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, he warns them, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Be careful. Serve the Lord with fear. Come to God with respect and serve him. Honor him and rejoice with trembling, with the recognition that you're standing in the presence of the God Almighty, the creator of the universe. It'll change how you approach God in your prayer. It'll change how you approach God in your worship on Sunday mornings. But how do we do it? How do we get there? How do we go from rebel to one at peace? How do we go from an outsider to the insider, from an orphan of sin to a blessed son? All that is in verse 12. Here's the answer to our problem presented in chapter 1. Kiss the son. The holy greeting, the intimate connection, the relationship. Kiss the son, relate to him, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. And so just as in chapter one, follow the law and live, disobey and die, kiss the son and live, or withhold your affections and die. 
And so he says, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. But here's the word of encouragement for us today as we think about the virus, for us for eternity as we think about life or death. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Do you study the law of the Lord? Are you perfect in your obedience? The answer is, of course, no. So now the question is, have you kissed the son? Have you entered into a relationship with the son of God, the king of all kings, the one who will sit on the throne of Jerusalem forever? If so, you're blessed just as though you would have been had you been perfectly obedient all along. Let me continue to pray for you to let you know that we're concerned for you. If you have needs, don't hesitate to contact the church office or email. We'll be glad to reach out to you in any way that we can under the law, but we'll definitely certainly lift you up in prayers as we go. But let's pray here and let's dismiss. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for this wonderful technology, the opportunity to gather together online, to share a few moments together in your word. Lord, bring these words home to us. Make our relationship with Christ sure. Lay it, Lord, change what we do. May it change how we approach you. And may we, Lord, be forever grateful for it. It's for all this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.